This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris. Our special guest today is Leslie Appleton-Young. Leslie is the Vice President and Chief Economist of the California Association of Realtors, a statewide trade organization with over 200,000 members dedicated to the advancement of professionalism in real estate. Leslie directs the activities of the association's member information group. She oversees the analysis of the housing market and brokerage industry trends, member communication and membership development activities. She is also closely involved in the association's strategic planning efforts and is a well-known speaker in California real estate community. Leslie, welcome back to our show. Thanks, Bruce. Great to be here. One of the things that I've, I've constantly heard over the last couple of years, and it's low inventory levels. So how have low inventory levels affected sales volume and an impact on price? And, and here's why I'm asking this. I would think if inventory levels were really low and they were matched with a lot of capacity to buy, we'd have really pre aggressive price increases, which we're really not. So that low inventory, what, what's, what's it affecting? Well, I, so you're saying that in the context of low inventory um, would just um, kind of be a... Um, a spur for people to list their homes. Well, it, it, no, maybe it's maybe it's really they're that's they're not doing that. Maybe they don't have the confidence level that they could get qualified, and so we have inventory that's not showing up. But the levels of inventory, you know, what about four months or something like that? Yeah, that doesn't seem extraordinary low. It's sort of it's sort of you know maybe a little bit low, but not like two months or San Francisco well, two weeks something like that yeah you know well it is so you have kind of a data problem which is pocket listings might ah, be impacting okay. that uh, number if you so we started calculating unsold inventory in the 80s and it, it's very simple it's a ratio of listings to sales right so currently if it, you know if inventory is around four it means that the current rate property is selling you're going to be out of inventory in four months. Now, up until about four years ago, if you were to ask me what normal inventory is, I would say a six to seven month supply because that was the long run average, right? Correct. If you look at the last four to five years, it's been between two, three, and four. And I think that this is a structural change in normal inventory. And there's a couple of different reasons. But I, I want to point my finger at, um, at the baby boomers because I think demographics is part of this. They're, they're a big group. Um, they are either voluntarily or have to work longer than their parents did. Many of them love their jobs, and some of them are still trying to recover from investment decisions that were made, um, made in the past. But we know that when you look at turnover rates, um, the turnover of the California housing stock varies, uh, but just to pick out the late 70s, it was 8 to 9% a year. And the last few years, we've been between 4 and 4.5%, four and like half wow. what we were. So um, another data point is the survey that we do every year, and we've talked about this, where we ask California realtors about their last closed transaction, and one of the questions is, how long had your seller been in the home. So these are people that actually sold. And um, the last two years, the average has been 10 years, and that's the highest in the 38 years we've done the survey. So that's kind of another data point. We know that over 70% of the Californians over 55 have not moved since 1999, not to throw so many too many out, uh, numbers out there. But the point is, boomers aren't moving because they're working longer, they're healthier longer, they want to stay in the game longer, their idea of retirement is not necessarily going to Sun City retirement community somewhere. They also have children that need their help. So you hear more and more about uh, married children with kids moving in with the parents, right? And they're going to inherit that house and help their parents 
as they get older. Wow, that you sounds like lot. Italy. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, and you hear about parents. Um, we did a survey of boomers, and like three quarters of them said they were going to help their kids buy a home, or they'd already done so, you know. So realizing that if they don't help their kids get into housing in California, the kids are going to have to go um, go somewhere else. And then the other component that um, Dr. Richard Green at the Lusk Center talks about a lot is just the fact that people aren't getting married like they used to. So they're getting married either not at all or they're getting married later. And if you look at home ownership and correct for, you know, age and ethnicity and income, it's really marriage that is the, you know, bouncing off point for home ownership. So it's it's a very complex situation, but the results are really clear. If people aren't listing their homes, if you know, you're right, they could sell it quickly. The prices are great. But where are they going to go? Mm-hmm. You know, if they want to stay in their own area, I heard a story from a realtor up in uh, Pleasanton, you know, up in uh, Contra Costa County saying, um, or in the East Bay saying, you know, I, I had a client who, who is renting out their big, you know, center hall colonial, and they've moved to a senior apartment <laughs> because that's what made sense for them to be able to stay in the area. So um, I think that's kind of uh, why it's a, a tough nut to crack, you know, and when you talk to boomers, uh, you know, like three, 64% of the ones we surveyed said, I'm not moving when I retire. You know, they're going out horizontally. <laughs> they're not going to sell. You know, um, it, it's just a whole interesting uh, change in the dynamic. Well, and what you're talking about, they're not moving out of their home. Uh, an even greater percentage were not, or won't be moving out of the area. They'll be shifting maybe the size of the house they have. But a lot of people really stay within a pretty tight distance. Is that, isn't that correct? <laughs> Well, I think it is, and again, it depends on, I think, where your kids and grandchildren are, but there certainly is a huge desire to be close enough to visit and so on, if that's possible. The, when, I was, when I was young, uh, way back when, <laughs> and looking... Not so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> and looking for, uh, for, looking for a home, I mean, the, the new builder was building the starter home. That was, that was really a common, right. a common thing, and now it, it isn't. You know, this whole thing on um, new construction is, is really tough, you know, and we spent a long time talking about it at that. We had a state-of-the-state state panel uh, this week at, at, at CAR, and there are just a lot of issues. I mean, as complicated as what we were just talking about in terms of why listings are so low, the issue is why is supply um, so much lower than the demand and it's complicated you know we've got a not in my backyard uh, culture in California you've had decades of down zoning you have CEQA which is a very necessary and well-intended uh, law that is used to stop just about everything I heard this really heart-wrenching story from the um, LA City Comptroller this week um, so Ron said that um, sequel, there was a, a lawsuit against a program where feral cats were rounded up, sterilized, and released back into their habitat. And under CEQA, they were sued because of the protection of birds. And so now the feral cats are euthanized. And I just was like, that's it. <laughs> you know, this has got to stop. Wow. Um, but that law is, is used, you know, and then the defect litigation um, is, is always an issue. So, um, and, you know, people go, you know, you go to San Francisco, you go to downtown L.A., you go to areas where you see a lot of new construction, but you have to realize for many years there wasn't much going on in terms of construction. And on the demand side, we are just swamping whatever is coming on the market. Well, and but in, let's say the counties that haven't recovered in price, so Riverside, San Bernardino, um, Kern, Sacramento, that their construction-based economies and the a lot of the inventory would not pencil yet, especially right. if, if it was a small structure. It, right, but you know that's changing. I mean, I'm I'm looking at the February data for job growth. Fresno had the fastest growth in February at 3.7%. Number two was the Inland Empire 
at 3.5, and number three was Modesto at a 3.1%. So what you're going to see is more movement um, of uh, jobs out to areas where housing is affordable, and I think that will put more upward pressure on prices, and you have a more business kind of a development-friendly uh, environment because there's more land. Definitely, we're, we're attracting we're attracting jobs, and um, it's that the builder, when they look at uh, the expense of carving up a lot, and they say, okay, now that I've gotten here at whatever level they are, 100 grand for the building lot, and the building fees are 50 grand, and they can build a 3,000 square foot house as opposed to a 1,400 square foot house, they're, they're going to push that if they can. Right, right, it, absolutely. Yeah, just, that's... Yeah, so the entry level is, is really hard. We visited a... Um, community outside of, well, in San Jose, but kind of on the outskirts called, uh, was Cottle Transit Station um, a week ago. And, you know, the prices were from 700 to 900,000, and it was kind of like three story townhomes. And this is like entry level in Silicon Valley adjacent. <laughs> So it it really makes you rethink, like, what do we mean by entry level and who's going to be able to afford it? One of the charts, and this was in the other segment, and you had mentioned talking about how rents were going up. There was um, something about Oakland. Median income was below 50000 and the median rent was three grand. Right. And you're right. just going, how's that possible? Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, it's gentrification, right? right? And so you have people leaving San Francisco and the peninsula and moving just across the bay to Oakland, which is a beautiful community, and picking up properties that maybe need um, need some work and certainly look affordable compared to the 1.3 million median in San Francisco. And so the neighborhood character starts to change, and there's the usual kind of gentrification um, issues. But for people that are living there and renting, you know, it's $3,000 for the median rent in Oakland. Like, who can afford that? Yeah, you know? that's, that's crazy. I mean, that's equivalent to a lot of purchase of real estate at 4% right. interest rate. Well, there's a big disconnect, right? And again, it's all about location. And as again, as we discussed earlier, people are voting with their feet, not necessarily because they want to, but because they have to. Okay. Um, if I look at a chart, first-time buyers certainly below their participation rate of normal. Yes. So, is it is it just about? Um, affordability or is there is there any lingering hesitancy about wanting to own something that maybe did damage the last cycle is there any it, lingering for that i don't see any evidence of that and there may be but the demand just so far outshadows it that it's not visible but the data that we've done in our surveys and what others have done in this area you know fanny has a confidence survey, a lot of other people do, um, shows that this is a generation that is very smart and savvy, and they know home ownership is probably a good bet for them, um, and it's just an affordability thing. So I don't think it's a, I don't, I don't see any data that supports this, oh, I don't want to own. You know, there, there definitely seems to be the re- recognition um, that this is something that they want to do. They just don't have the uh, always the information to make that happen. You know, I know, I mean, we started surveying generationally because we did hear three or four years ago, not only the point you were making about I've been burned or my parents were burned, so I'm not uh, going in, but also the idea of mobility and the fact the the shared economy and owning just isn't where I need to be. But, you know, I'm working literally 10 minutes from downtown Los Angeles, which is in the biggest renaissance (laughs) of the last 40 years in terms of um, condo development and apartment development. And it has a young vibe like I've never seen, you know, so I don't, I don't see evidence for that, uh, at least not yet or not anymore. We're at affordability number, what, about 31, something in that yes. range? Okay. Yes. Now, historically, that's, that's not low. 
Um, you know, it's varies by region, right? So if you're in the Bay Area, in yeah. San Francisco, it's 10%. And they're, you know? they have their own history. You're right. But uh, um, just the state number being 31, you have you have pockets of plenty of affordability, um, like even above their norm. So Riverside would be above their bottom if you looked at 89 and 2006 and 80 even. They probably will will be way higher. So when we say we have an affordability problem, is that the payment ratio or, or is it we're not being able to get a yes answer from a lender under the current mm, circumstances? I think it's you can't find the home. You know, okay. yes, we're buying the median priced home and you can afford it. Where is it? <laughs> so one of the charts that I use looks at the mismatch between job growth and units, right? So in L.A. County, uh, from 2010 through 2016, I don't number somewhere around, what, 190,000 new jobs? Yeah. And less than 100,000 new units. I saw that chart for the first time. That was an amazing chart. Right, it is. So there's a mismatch between where the jobs are being created and where the housing stock is. So, you know, the affordability index, and this actually reminds me of how we first started talking in the first place, right, back in the day, <laughs> is, is really a methodological construct, you know, and it allows you to compare today with other, uh, other periods, and is it tighter or is it looser? But it doesn't look at the issue really directly of inventory and what's available for sale. So you can't really find that median priced home in the areas where the job growth is strong. Um, and that's really the conundrum. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's changed in this, this cycle that we've had where we've had pretty good price run up is the conservative nature of the owner. Because if you were in 2004 and five, you had a credit line, uh, an equity line put on your home, and you might have, you might be buying two other houses. Where this time, that hasn't happened. We haven't borrowed money out. Well, I hope that's true. I mean, I, I do hear rumblings about equity loans and you know household debt is um, recovering and so on. Um, but I, I do think people are. Um, they have short memories, but we're still in that short memory period. So I, I hope that that is, uh, that is true because, um, you know, the, and you and I agree on this, right? One of the things people don't talk enough about is the role that cash out refis played in the disaster we all experienced. And, um, I, I'm hoping that that doesn't, um, isn't, attractive again <laughs> I, I wouldn't want them to outlaw either uh, you know no, a cash no, out no. refi or a credit line because you can be pretty entrepreneurial with a credit line absolutely but you have to be smart about it and a lot of people weren't no. right they cashed out and they bought a boat and went to italy and then there's no cushion for a downturn you know one of the things we we hadn't talked about but maybe it's not as a big influence at this point but Cash buyers were a really dominant player for quite a while. And so that would have been very difficult to compete if you were an FHA buyer. Absolutely. And there's still some of that. I mean, investors aren't quite as active as they were a few years ago. Um, China has made it harder uh, to get money out. They're really enforcing that 50000 cap. Um, and so that has made it a little bit more competitive for um, uh, for first time home buyers. So that's very positive for them. <laughs> so what do you what do you think the well, first of all, any surprises from the year 2016 were? Uh, you know, I guess I'm just surprised that we continue to have such a static market in a way. And I'm talking about sales. Um, I realize now that when people ask me if we're at the peak of the market, that they're always asking about price, and I'm always thinking about the number of transactions, so I have to really specify that. But, you know, we bottomed in the fall of oh, 2007, and we came roaring back with, you know, inland properties selling for less than replacement cost and first-time and repeat buyer tax credits. But if you look at the last five years and you consider the rebound in – jobs, incomes, household formation, and the record low rates, I would have thought we'd see transactions 20 or 25 percent higher than they have been. And that's why I spend so much time talking about uh, inventory and supply 
constraints and housing affordability. So I guess I was just surprised that we're still kind of stuck. Yeah. And then just how dramatic the migration data is and how migration data within and going out of California is a housing story. With the charts that we have, instead of looking at 400,000 sales, we should be looking at 500. Right. And, right. And I am surprised at that, too. And I think that that impacts the lack of aggression on the median price or yes. price in general, just because they're just, yeah. there isn't the push that looks like there should naturally be. Right. What, right. What's your feeling about the overall economy going forward? Let's say a couple of years. Um, every chart that I look at, there at some point in the next two years, we're due a recession, but I'm not sure where the direction would be for that. So just well, want actually, your I thought this year was the seventh year that we were due or whatever year. All the numbers people, <laughs> I think, have been saying we're due for a recession. And I kept saying, in order to have that cycle work, you really need to have a much stronger recovery. And we've had a very lackluster recovery. So there's a lot of uncertainty, right? I mean, the, the Trump administration um, is looking at a 4% growth rate. Most economists are saying, I don't see how you can possibly get there given the uh, demographics of the labor force, you know, that it's older and it's less um, productive than, than we um, had hoped. So there's a lot of unknowns. You know, I think the, the concerns that I have are a little bit longer term, and they have to do with with jobs, right? Because housing, uh, household income, household formation uh, really lives upon a um, foundation of of a good job. And when you look at the Rust Belt and Appalachia and what happened um, to to that area of the country, it's you look at jobs, right? And so I um, I'm I'm looking at um, artificial intelligence. I'm looking at robotics. Um, I, you know, applaud job creation in any form, but bringing in low-paying jobs back to the United States is not the solution. (laughs) It really is um, education and teaching. You know, I think every tech company ought to open an office in Appalachia and teach those kids in middle school how to code because they're smart and they just need to be part of this this future that we're all uh, living in, but I think that's one of the big um, uncertainties that um, that I have is, and I have faith that there will be other jobs. I mean, 30 years ago, did anybody think the cell phone industry would look and be look like it is and be as large as it is? Um, so I want to just do this. Isn't even a plug. It's just a book recommendation. That's uh, I just think this book was fabulous, and it came out a couple of years ago. It's by a economics professor at Berkeley named um, Enrico Moretti. And the book is called The New Geography of Jobs. And um, just explaining where jobs grow and why and what these clusters look like. But I will tell you the thing that has stayed with me, um, having read this book three or four years ago, is the introduction where he talks about um, a guy. He may have been a college professor. I can't remember. But he is, it's 1968 or 1969. He's in the Bay Area. And he is trying to decide where to move, where to buy a home to raise his family. And the two cities that he's looking at are very comparable. Mm -hmm. Now, the two cities are Menlo Park and Visalia. Hmm. And today, right, 2017, you're like, what? Hmm. But in the late 1960s, they looked very similar in terms of income and education and school school quality and crime. So that's really the bouncing off point for his thesis about what happened in Silicon Valley and what can we learn to um, uh, kind of foster job growth in other parts of the country. So I think to me, it's all about housing, but before housing, it's all about jobs. And with that, Leslie, we are out of time. I th- want to thank you for what you do for the industry, and I really appreciate you guys providing all those charts that I would be lost without. So I really appreciate that. 
Bruce, my data is your data, and it's always <laughs> delightful to spend uh, time speaking with you. Thank you very much, Leslie. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.